from uh, about 15 years on up, uh, a great deal of my thoughts were uh, basically unshareable. We are all evil in some form or another. Yes, I am not 100%, but I am evil. My mother was a, a sick, angry, hungry, and very sad woman. I hated her, but I wanted to love my mother. This is Serial Killing, a podcast. Hello, my name is Alyssa Carroll, and welcome to Serial Killing, a podcast, where we go through the life stories of serial killers to see if we might catch a glimpse of why they displayed their famous, vile, and disturbing behaviors. Special thanks to some of my patrons, Janice, Pixie, Rachel, Whitney, Maya, Alethea, Elena, Aaron, Katoras, Catherine, Sam, Linda, Katarina, Teresa, Sophie, Nanette, Emma, Emily, Galen, Bree, David, John, and Judy. Thank you so much, guys. You truly are appreciated. And for anyone else, please feel free to join my patrons so that I can bring you more of what you crave. And also like, share, and subscribe. It might help our little community grow. David John Carpenter was born on May 6, 1930 in San Francisco, California. So, as we always do, let's get into some history for that time. Ethiopia got a new emperor, and he was known for his efforts to bring Ethiopia into the international community by joining the League of Nations and, later, the United Nations. Britain's largest airship, the R-101, while on its very first overseas trip, crashed in Beauvais, France, killing nearly all 60 people on board. This led to the eventual abandonment of the British on airship development. The very first FIFA World Cup took place during July in Montevideo, Uruguay. It was envisioned as an international tournament for soccer after it was announced that the sport would be dropped from the upcoming 1932 Olympic Games. The very first games in the World Cup were played between France against Mexico and the United States against Belgium. The entire tournament was won by the host Uruguay after they defeated Argentina. Unfortunately, several of the top European teams, including England, Germany, Italy, Spain, and Holland, missed the inaugural cup due to the Great Depression and the high cost of travel. And of course, we've discussed this many times, but this marked the beginning of the Great Depression. The Wall Street crash happened in late 1929, and by 1930, 1,350 banks failed in the U.S., Unemployment in the United Kingdom hit 1 million, while it reached 8.7% in the United States, which was over 3.2 million people, nearly double what was in previous years. The worldwide economic decline reached its worst point in 1933. In India, Mahatma Gandhi and his followers began a 200-mile march to the salt beds of Jalapur. The salt march was Gandhi's nonviolent protest that took place from March to April, and it was the first of his acts of civil disobedience against British rule in India. India was not allowed to produce or sell salt independently. They finished their journey on April 5th after traveling 240 miles. Then they picked up salt on the shore of the Arabian Sea to, quote, produce salt, thus technically breaking the law. No one was arrested in this first act of civil disobedience. In Argentina, the government was overthrown by a coup d'etat. The president of the country was quickly forced out of power as he had become unpopular when the Great Depression hit the world economies, causing high inflation and unemployment in Argentina. 
future president Juan Peron was involved in the coup. Now this next one I hold very dear to my heart. Well, my nerd crush Neil deGrasse Tyson continues to rip it back out, but in 1930 the planet Pluto was discovered by astronomer Clyde W. Tombaugh at the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. He found Pluto by using a blank microscope to switch rapidly between sets of photographic plates to detect subtle changes and movements, a new technique at the time. In 2006, the International Astronomical Union downgraded Pluto from a planet to a dwarf planet. Jerks. I mean, she has a giant heart on her chest. That was just rude. Anyway, also this year, the city of Constantinople in Turkey changed its name to Istanbul. Now that song's going to be an earworm. A hurricane hit the Dominican Republic with 200 mile per hour winds, leaving more than 8,000 people dead. For the first time anywhere in the world, a television drama was broadcast. The drama is a production of Luigi Parandello's The Man with the Flower in His Mouth. It was broadcast by the BBC from Bayard Studios at 133 Long Acre, London. Some other notable people born this year were Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, Sean Connery, Warren Buffett, Steve McQueen, Ray Charles, Clint Eastwood, Gene Hackman, and Princess Margaret, who was the Queen Elizabeth's little sister. So this was the atmosphere that David was born into. David's parents were Elwood Carpenter and Francis Hart. Their engagement notice in the newspaper shows that Elwood was 29 and Francis 22 years old. The article was published in the San Francisco Examiner in August 1929. David was born nine months later. I didn't find anywhere that he had any siblings, though there wasn't a lot of specific childhood information about David. Sources stated that his father was a severe alcoholic and his mother, who was apparently nearly blind, was domineering. Both were physically and mentally abusive. It was said that both parents were quite strict with him. So as we can imagine, he began having problems at a very young age. At just seven years old, he already had a pronounced stutter. This in turn made social situations extremely difficult for him. The other kids bullied him relentlessly because of it, and it greatly hindered his social skills. He was also described as extremely reclusive, very introverted, and isolated himself as much as he could. It was also said that his mother forced him to dress in very formal, fancy clothing, which of course was not necessary for everyday school and other activities, and he just was teased about all of that as well. Frances also insisted her son take violin lessons, piano lessons, as well as ballet. But if he spoke up in any way, he could expect either of his parents to beat him relentlessly. It was noted that he continued to wet the bed long into his childhood and well past the normal age. This, of course, would also be rewarded with severe beatings. And so, predictably, he began taking his frustrations out on animals, abusing them to vent his frustrations. As he grew into his adolescent years, it was said that he developed a sex drive earlier than what is considered typical, and he began looking for opportunities to be able to express this drive. By the age of 14, it was discovered that he had been sexually abusing some other kids, though sources didn't specify, and it was also heavily suggested that the abuse was violent in nature, so he was committed to Napa State Hospital. 
Now, this facility was the first asylum for the, quote, insane in California, and it opened under the name Stockton Asylum in 1851. And as we have heard countless times, as far as mental health facilities go, it very rapidly became overcrowded. An article written in the Napa Valley Marketplace magazine stated that in the late 1930s through 1949, and side note, David was sent there in 44, electroshock therapy was the preferred therapy, but prefrontal lobotomies were just beginning to be used, though this was not performed on David, at least that I could find. But Napa State Hospital was a place that tried to treat patients that had a pretty wide variety of issues. So this is where David was sent. I can't verify how long he was there, but he was discharged at some point. Then, when he was 17 years old, it came to light that he was molesting his younger cousins, only eight and three years old at the time, and he was arrested. He was then sent to the California Youth Authority for one year. This is the same California Youth Authority that later, Edmund Kemper would be sentenced after murdering his grandparents at just 15 years old. David was only kept there for one year. And that was all I could find out about his childhood, guys. So let's review. I just have to say that it always saddens me when I can't find much information about at least the parents. We know that David's father was a severe alcoholic and his mother had vision problems as well as being described as domineering. Now, children who grow up in a home with a parent who abuses alcohol usually feel like they never truly know what to expect from day to day. Their home life is unpredictable. Often, there are loud arguments or disagreements, inconsistency from the parent or parents, unreliability, and chaos. These children generally do not get their emotional needs met due to this environment. This often leads to negative behaviors and difficulties in learning to properly care for themselves and their feelings later in life because they were so preoccupied with the parents' dysfunctional behavior. Kids generally live in a perpetual cycle of stress and sadness, fear and anger for their survival. So then later in life, these children can develop similar characteristics and personality traits. And this isn't just for children of alcoholics, but extends to kids who grew up in families where there were other compulsive behaviors, which includes his mother. These children often have difficulty following projects through from beginning to end, lie when it would be just as easy to be honest, judge themselves too harshly, have a more difficult time relaxing enough to experience anything fun. They have difficulty with intimate relationships, overreact to changes that they feel they have no control over, are impulsive, and they tend to lock themselves in a course of action without giving serious consideration. The list is long. They then grow up to display behaviors such as isolation, fearing people and authority figures, view themselves as perpetual victims. They feel guilty when standing up for themselves, confuse love and pity, have low self-esteem, and so on. Then we have the added bonus of his mother being domineering, something of which I am intimately familiar with. Psychologists have stated that very controlling parenting is detrimental to a child's health, and the negative effects often follow the children into adulthood. These kids generally are at great risk of developing anxiety disorders. They are more likely to have troubles making decisions, have low self-esteem, and feel uncomfortable in leadership roles. And then with mothers high in narcissistic traits and those who need to control their children, often see their children as extensions of themselves, not as individuals. The amount of love and understanding is directly correlated to how well they fulfill their mother's expectations. According to Psychology Today, 
Quote, children whose emotional needs aren't met in childhood, whose mothers are not attuned enough, who are ignored or not given the support and room to explore, are said to be insecurely attached. There are three types of insecure attachment, anxious preoccupied, dismissive avoidant, and fearful avoidant. The daughter who displays the anxious preoccupied style actually wants close connection, but she is hypervigilant about being spurned and rejected. She's highly sensitive to perceived slights and emotionally volatile. The dismissive avoidant doesn't seek close connection. She sees other people as too needy and prides herself on her independence and resilience. The fearful avoidant actually wants connection, but her emotional vulnerability makes her self-protect. She's motivated by fear, end quote. And we can dive deeper into these attachment styles in another podcast if you'd like. So we also know that David had a rather pronounced stutter, which is a speech disorder that is sometimes also called stammering or defluent speech. According to the National Institute of Deafness and Other Communication Disorders, stuttering affects about 5 to 10% of all children at some point, most often occurring between the ages of 2 and 6. Brain injuries from a stroke, neurophysiology, and other factors can cause a stutter. But I think in the case of David, the other children in a similar environment, it can be caused from severe emotional trauma. This is referred to as psychogenic stuttering. He was bullied due to how his mother dressed him. His stutter and the extracurricular activities his mother forced him to participate in, and we all know how horribly bullying affects children. We also know he was severely physically abused as well, which speaks for itself. So he began abusing animals at a young age and sexually abused children when he himself was just beginning his adolescence. In the book, quote, Children and Young People Who Sexually Abuse Others by Richard Beckett, it argues on the basis of currently available research that with adolescence, the risk of both violent and general reoffending appears greater than the risk of sexual reoffending. In fact, adolescent sex offenders commit a substantial number of sex crimes, including 17% of all arrests for sex crimes and approximately one third of all sex offenses against children. It is known that sexual interest in much younger teens or even children is a red flag. Age differences that suggest a developmental and power differential, say like a 16-year-old showing interest in a 12-year-old are yet another red flag. Teens who feel powerless in other areas of their lives may try to gain power in ways that are not acceptable, including sexual activity with somebody much younger. So there's that. David was admitted to a facility which did nothing to help him curb his sexual appetite, and he reoffended by assaulting his own small cousins at 17 years old. This behavior and early experimentation with sexual violence is a strong indicator of a sociopathic personality disorder. So, let's get back into the story. It was said that once he was released a year after being held at the California Youth Authority, which was the second facility he had to be housed in for sexual predatory behavior, he went right back into his old habits, sexually molesting and assaulting younger kids. Once he was out of high school, he apparently worked several different jobs, including being a salesman, a ship's purser, and at a printer. Sources say he even served for the Coast Guard for a brief time and was honorably discharged. It seemed he was trying to at least blend into normal society. So in 1955, now 25-year-old David met and married 19-year-old Ellen. Very early in their marriage, they began having children. 
Their first child was a son born in 1956, their first daughter in 58, and their second daughter and final child in 1960. Now, Ellen later complained that David had a voracious sexual appetite and nearly demanded them have sex three times a night minimum. It was said that if she turned him down, he would go into a rage and leave the house to watch and stalk other women. So his first known attack was in July 1960. A work acquaintance of his, Lois, and he were talking about his new baby and David asked her if she might want to come home with him to see his infant daughter. Lewis had met and had a good rapport with Ellen, so she felt comfortable accepting the offer to see the baby. Once they were in the car, rather than driving toward his house, he began driving down a deserted road. David feigned ignorance, claiming he was lost, and he pulled over. He then grabbed Lois, straddled her, producing a bit of clothesline and bound her hands. He pulled out a knife and threatened her to be still, stabbing her in the hand. David said he had a, quote, funny quirk that needed to be satisfied. Lois fought hard against her attacker and he struck her in the head several times with a hammer. And in that moment, she realized that he was no longer stuttering, that he was speaking slowly and deliberately. Luckily, a military patrol officer had seen the car turn down a deserted road that he knew no one was supposed to be driving down, and he decided to follow. Now, as he approached the car, he saw the attack and ordered David to stop immediately. David produced a gun and shot at the officer, missing him. The officer pulled his gun and shot David, wounding him in the stomach and in the leg. He then arrested David. Now, when questioned, he claimed to have blacked out during the entire attack, but was ultimately sentenced to 14 years in prison. Ellen, once learning of what her husband had done, promptly filed for divorce. So, psychiatrists evaluated him while he was in prison and they later stated that David told several different versions of the story of what happened, ranging from him and Lois having a lover's quarrel to how he had no memory of it due to amnesia. They reported that David has, quote, sociopathic personality disorder, which today is antisocial personality disorder, and he scored 125 on an IQ test, which is definitely above average. In 1969, and after only serving nine of his 14 years, he was paroled. It was said that he was a model prisoner and caused no trouble. Though I was not able to find how he met her, four months after being out of prison, David quickly got married to a woman named Helen that August. The marriage was doomed from the beginning, didn't last. Only five months later, David could control himself no longer, and he hit a woman's car with his own, so she would have to exit her vehicle. His plan was successful. He grabbed her and attempted to sexually assault her, but she got away from him, got back into her car, and escaped. So David made a decision. You see, he needed to sexually assault women, but he did not want to go back to prison. So, you know, of course, his logical conclusion was to end the lives of his victims. And side note, that is not a logical solution to an already illogical problem. That same day, after nearly getting the woman in her car, he broke into the home of a woman, kidnapped her, sexually assaulted her, then he stole her car. Two days later, he kidnapped yet another woman and sexually assaulted her while her infant witnessed. The mother said that he was quite kind to her baby. Thankfully, he was found and arrested the same day. 
While in custody awaiting trial, he escaped from jail through a skylight but was captured soon after. He was then sentenced to nine years and was again paroled in May 1979. At this point, he was 49 years old and he was not a registered sex offender. It took him all of three months to attack again. That August, a woman who was hiking in a nearby state park was found naked, shot in the back of her head while in a kneeling position. Her murderer had gone through her purse and had taken her credit cards, but oddly, she had not been sexually assaulted. Several months later, another victim would be found murdered in the same position, but she succumbed to being stabbed repeatedly and mutilated. It was said that her long, agonized screams could be heard by nearby golfers who did not investigate where they were coming from. Seven months later, a woman who had gone for a jog in the park was found with a fatal gunshot wound to her head in March of 1980. An eyewitness saw who they'd later determined to be David come from behind a tree and attack a woman who was out hiking with her dog holding a knife. The witness ran to get help, but by the time she returned with the police, the woman was dead, her dog sitting and waiting beside her. She was able to give the police a very accurate description of the attacker, and David had left his prison-issued glasses at the scene. That October, a young woman was walking out in the woods at the state park, overlooking the Golden Gate Bridge, when David sexually assaulted and shot her three times and killed her. Her remains were not discovered until a year later. And either that same day or within days of the latest attack, David murdered a couple who had been on a hiking trip in another nearby state park. Their remains were found a month later. More and more bodies were being found in very shallow graves in area state parks. Most, all, had been stripped of their clothing, raped, murdered, and redressed. And yet David was able to maintain the appearance of an average everyday man. He was enrolled in classes about computer printing at the California Trade School and did earn a degree. He worked as a typesetter instructor at an agency that was affiliated with the trade school he had graduated from. The people that knew him said he had taken up hiking as a hobby and thought nothing of it. So in March 1981, David came up on a young couple hiking as they were on spring break from college. He stopped them, held them at gunpoint, and stated he was going to rape the girl. After the assault, he shot both of them, killing the girl, but the young man survived with a gunshot wound to his neck. He would go on to give the police a very clear description of their attacker. Another 20-year-old girl who went missing in May, her remains found later, had been a co-worker of David's at the Econo Quick Print. Other co-workers described David, who was now 51 years old, as a creep who was very much interested in dating her. Now, she asked David to give her a ride over to Santa Cruz so that she could buy a car from one of David's friends. David had promised her that it would be a good purchase. Later that month, her remains were discovered. He had shot her point blank in the face. After he had murdered her, he had treated himself to a night of dinner and ballet. In June 1981, in Castle Rock State Park, to be specific, some rock climbers found a jawbone. They took it to the police where it was examined and matched with some partial remains of a 17-year-old girl who had been missing for six months. David had been a strong suspect in her disappearance. You see, she worked at a bank part-time while she finished high school and David banked at that facility. Many witnesses saw David holding conversations with the young woman often. 
Many joked that she was the only reason he banked there, but there wasn't much evidence and her cause of death could not be determined. But armed with the sketches and a description of his car, along with the murder of his coworker, David was finally arrested. Due to the immense amount of publicity surrounding the case as they had finally caught the trailside killer, his trial had to be moved to Los Angeles. Of course, this did nothing to help his case as the evidence of his guilt became obvious. David was ultimately sentenced to die in the gas chamber in San Quentin. The judge stated, quote, The defendant's entire life has been a continuous expression of violence and force almost beyond exception. I must conclude with the prosecution that if ever there was a case appropriate for the death penalty, this is it, end quote. And this first death penalty would not be his last after all of the trials were over. So even though he was born in 1930, which makes him now 91 years old as of the time of this recording, he is still alive and behind bars. He is listed as having between eight to 10 victims, but it is highly likely that there are more. He is still imprisoned in San Quentin State Prison today. He had an insatiable lust for sex and violence that had been with him since his young adolescence. He had been in and out of institutions since he was 14 years old, and yet the last time he was released in 1979, he was not registered as a sex offender? Why? He was quite clearly a very disturbed individual, diagnosed as an antisocial sociopath, and yet he was released time and time again. In these instances, I do my best to try to remember that laws are in place and thank God for most of them, but they have limits with regards to punishment and repaying the debt to society. I mean, David was even looked into as being a possible Zodiac killer for a time, though he was cleared. Still, I feel as though this is another one that fell through the cracks that could have been stopped long before anyone had to die. But tell me guys, what do you think? Leave me a comment below, or you can DM me on Instagram at serial underscore killing. All of my contact information is below. Most importantly, guys, thank you so, so much for listening because I know you could be listening to anyone else, but you chose me and I really appreciate that. Thanks so much, guys. Like and subscribe. Talk to you soon. Have a good day.